continuing along. So we're getting near the end here uh, with this section. So let's talk about catalysts and let's continue talking about intermediates a little bit more. So a catalyst, you've probably heard of this before. It's quite a common term. Um, but in our chemistry, um, a catalyst is a substance that speeds up a reaction without being consumed itself. Uh, and it does this by lowering the activation energy of a reaction. So for example, if we did a reaction that had a large activation energy and we did not use a catalyst, so here you can see uncatalyzed pathway. So it would have a rather large activation uh, barrier that it has to get over. But now if we were to add a catalyst, and what's important to note is we can um, do some engineering type chemistry where we purposefully add a catalyst to speed up a reaction. Or if we were studying um, biological or environmental chemistry, some processes in biology and environmental science are just naturally catalyzed. So the body's natural catalysts, so we'll say a bio catalyst is called an enzyme. Okay, and so your body has loads of enzymes um, that help speed up reactions going on in your body, such as metabolism and so on. Um, and so when something is catalyzed, it has a much lower activation energy. And I'll remind you here with my simulation, if I lower the activation energy, you can see now that that reaction is getting faster, right? The reactants are getting consumed more quickly if I lower the activation energy. So once again, I'll remind you, intermediate is a substance that is formed from reactants and goes on to react further, giving products. So here now we have um, a three-step mechanism. Um, and if we were to balance all of these reactions, we would find the total you know, global overall reaction. But now if we look at this and we, and we realize now when we start having these complex mechanisms, we're going to have a variety of catalysts and or intermediates. So let's identify them. Um, so I'm going to do the um, intermediates in blue. So we know that it's a substance that is formed from reactants and goes on to react further, giving products. So if I look at this first elementary step, bimolecular O3 plus NO makes O2 and NO2. Aha! And now that NO2 appears as a reactant in the very next step. So we can recognize now that this has to be an intermediate because it gets produced, but then it gets consumed in the very next step. Okay. Um, and now you notice we actually have um, another intermediate here. Now an oxygen atom is created, which is unstable. So it's going to continue to react until it makes something stable. So there it is there. And in this mechanism, it reacts with O3 to form another O2, which is stable, okay? So now, what about the catalysts, okay? So um, we'll do the catalysts in red. So now if we go back to this um, first step here, um, ah, look, we can see now that in step number one, we consumed an NO as a reactant, but then it got created again as a product. And so what that means, because it's get, getting created again, it's going to keep cycling back around and around and around until everything, namely here the ozone, our main reactant, is completely consumed, right? So the catalyst is not itself going to be consumed, but it will keep spinning round and round and round until all of the reactants have been converted over, including all of the intermediates have been converted over, okay? So I wanna spend some time talking about um, some catalysts in the environment and focusing on um, um, some not purposeful catalytic reactions. So these are reactions that um, are occurring in the atmosphere uh, by accident. And so um, that's ozone depletion via chlorofluorocarbons. Um, so ozone in the upper atmosphere, and by upper atmosphere, I mean like, you know, like above where airplanes fly, like way, way up there. 
Um, so this filters harmful UV radiation, and without it, life on Earth would not be possible. So you might have um, learned a, a thing or two about the ozone layer in some of your classes. Um, if not, the important thing to note is we have this blanket in our upper atmosphere uh, uh, comprising of O3, and when harmful UV radiation comes down from the sun, the O3 blocks that radiation and prevents it from getting down into um, where we live. And that's a good thing because that UV radiation is toxic. So that would induce skin cancer for humans very quickly um, and it would be damaging for plant life. So it's a good thing we have this ozone layer, okay? Um, so this is the natural mechanism for ozone decomposition. So there is actually a seasonal cycle for ozone, namely in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, so that's what you're seeing right there, the bottom of the planet. Um, and this is the harmful UV radiation that I was speaking of. So ozone absorbs that UV light and it does this like in a sacrificial way. Um, so it absorbs that UV light and becomes an oxygen atom intermediate and a stable O2 molecule. That oxygen atom quickly reacts with another O3 to form more O2. And if I balance this overall, you can see two O3s become three O2s. And so now you might be asking yourself, well, why do we have an ozone layer for the, in the first place if it's just naturally decomposing? Well, once again, this is seasonal. This only happens um, certain times of the year and the rest of the year, ozone builds back up in concentration. And this has been going on for millions of years, right before humans got here. Um, and we see in the fossil record um, uh, that we know that there was life on earth like a billion years ago or hundreds of millions of years ago. So we know that the ozone layer has had to have been stable. At least we suspect that it's had to have been stable over the past millions of years, okay? Well, starting in the um, 80s and in the 70s, it was observed that this seasonal ozone depletion um, was becoming even greater. And as you can see here, if you look at this from 1980 to about 2000, um, the natural ozone hole that's formed in the Southern Hemisphere for only a brief period of time was actually starting to grow and becoming quite large. So this hole is showing you like where there's this ozone being depleted. Um, and so it was discovered by some very smart folks at UC Irvine in Orange County that chlorofluorocarbons, and so this is a chlorofluorocarbon, can destroy ozone. So these chlorofluorocarbons are used as coolants and refrigerants. Um, they were also widely used in um, aerosol canisters. Um, but since uh, 1995, they were outlawed. They were banned across the world because it was discovered that they're causing this hole in the ozone layer. And this discovery of this chemistry led to this worldwide environmental litigation and legislation that started regulating these CFCs. So how does this mechanism work? Well, as it turns out, these CFC molecules, they're very stable. They don't react with anything. And that's why um, they were invented in the first place as coolants because someone said, hey, look at the super stable molecule I made. It doesn't react, it doesn't decompose. We can put it in a refrigerator or an air conditioner. Um, and it can help go on to uh, create a cool environment. And because it won't react, uh, we never have to replace it. So that's like good business thinking, right? I just made this super stable molecule that's not gonna react. Um, but that's terrible environmental thinking because if you make this super stable molecule that's not gonna react, it's gonna be able to persist into the environment. And so once CFCs make it they distribute all through the globe, right? The wind blows, it mixes things all around. Once these chlorofluorocarbons get up into the upper atmosphere around where ozone is reacting, they too can react with this powerful sunlight. And that releases a chlorine atom. So that's a free atom, a chlorine free radical, which is super reactive, 
okay? Oops, I'm missing a plus sign here. So now what happens is once these chlorine radicals are released in the atmosphere, they react with ozone, they make CLO, which you can see that CLO is an intermediate, okay, there it gets produced and then consumed. Well, the CLO reacts with more O3 and reproduces the chlorine atom radical, which you can see acts as a catalyst, okay? So it keeps driving this cycle round and round and round and round. And you notice here for the natural decomposition of ozone, so here's the uncatalyzed, it's a two-step mechanism, as you can see right here. So it's got two activation energies. The activation energies are quite large. And because the activation energies are quite large, that's why this um, reaction naturally only depletes ozone a little bit and under seasonal conditions. But the catalyzed version of this reaction, once again, two-step reaction, and there we can see the two steps, it really lowers the activation energy. And so that might be a good thing if we were like purposefully wanting to destroy ozone, but because we don't want to destroy ozone, this is what's led to this being a, a really bad thing, okay? On the positive side, in 1995, the governments of the world enacted the Montreal Protocol, um, which to date has been one of the most successful environmental legislation events in the world. It's not just the United States that decided to say we're not gonna use CFCs, the whole world phased them out. And now what's beginning to happen, this ozone hole formation has hit a minimum and it's starting to recover, which is pretty cool. Okay. Um, so I'm going to record one last short video with more environmental examples and how kinetics is used to study environmental chemistry.